Hello everyone, welcome to Crime Corner with me, Raina Kay, where I sit in my corner and talk all true crime everything. So before I begin with my very first case on this channel, I wanted to give you all a little bit of information about myself and why I'm starting this channel. So I'm from Texas, I'm a true crime addict. I'm talking anything from shows, books, articles, um, even here on YouTube, I'm constantly researching and looking for updates on cases and would like to raise some awareness for the victims in these cases as well as their families um, to get eyes back on some of the cold cases, ones where justice didn't prevail, and some cases that I have seen had very little to no coverage on here before. Um, I hope that you'll stick around and become a member of the Crime Corner family for all of the upcoming cases that I have planned to cover um, I'm also going to do my very best to save my opinions to the end of the video um, just to keep things in order. And if you don't want to hear me ramble and give my opinion, that's okay too. I just truly appreciate you taking the time to be here. And I, like I said, just want to get eyes back on the cases and that's the end goal. So um, again, also everything in the video is all alleged and things that I researched to the best of my ability um, with everything that I could find that's out there as far as articles, news clippings, things like that. Um, I will link everything down in the description box below so you can do your own research with me as well and maybe we could help solve this case together, all of us. Um, again, I'm... I'm doing this and I'm making this with the very best intentions and in no way is it meant to be any form of disrespect to the victims or their families. I do this with the utmost respect for them and just want justice to be served in this case. That has been cold now for 34 years this July 4th that just passed. Um, you know, it's just such a long time to have no answers and it's very heartbreaking. The case has stayed on my mind and in my heart since I was a child. I want to say I was about six when I first heard about it, and I'm really hoping that by making this, we can finally get some justice for Sally and Shane and their families. Also, um, I'm going to be using certain words. If you're part of the true crime community, you already know things like unaliving, stuff like that, so the video won't get flagged. And I'll also be inserting images as we go along. So with all of that being said, let's begin with the very first case on this channel. So on the night of July 4th, 1988, something would happen that would leave two families searching for answers as to what happened to their loved ones, Shane Stewart and Sally McNally, and the last time anyone would ever see them alive again. Before we go into the night of events that occurred, I want to tell you about Sally and Shane individually, um, just to give you a better picture of how they were, who they were, and just to give some backstory. So Sally McNally was a beautiful brunette, as you can see, who lived in San Angelo, Texas which was a big ranching community at the time and a very peaceful and safe place to live and raise your family in. She was born on March 26, 1970 to her mother, Patricia, who would go by Pat for short. So that's how I'll be referring to her in this video. Um, so Pat did an interview on an Unsolved Mysteries show that covered this case. And in her interview, she stated that she had Sally when she was when she was young, and in her own words, she said that they grew up together. Now, her father isn't mentioned in anything that I could find, and Pat said the same thing, that he was not involved in her and Sally's life. Now, in that interview that was done on, um, an interview that was done on the 25th anniversary of, the tra of this tragic date, it does have her stepdad in it, who said he loved her very much. Now, Sally was known as a sweet girl who would do anything for a friend, and in her mom's words, she was a people pleaser, and meaning she just wanted to be liked by everyone. She loved daffodil flowers and was an amazing friend and wasn't just beautiful on the outside, but was a beautiful person on the inside as well. 
And she would show that to everyone that she was around. Everyone said the same thing. Now, there's not any information about her childhood, so I can't do a deep dive. So all of this that we're talking about is when the kids were in high school, um, when all of this, this took place. So when Sally was a teenager in high school, her mom stated that she would sometimes sneak out. And one night, her mom stayed in her bedroom and waited until Sally came back and she eventually did and got came back in through the window. So her mother had questioned her and Sally would tell her that she had gone out for a walk and just needed to get some fresh air. One other time that Sally snuck out, her mom called one of Sally's guy friends and his mom answered and proceeded to tell Pat in this lady's words that the kids were mixed up in Satan worship. She would also tell Pat that the same group of kids that were over at her house, that one night they, when they were there, the kids told her that they caught a demon in a bottle. There was also a good friend of Sally's named Helen in the Unsolved Mysteries episode that stated she that Sally told her she had gotten sad in her life and she just got to a point where she felt that no one loved her. It's not clear why Sally felt this way but this is where she would meet a group of friends that Sally told Helen, her good friend, that she felt that love from them that she needed and craved. Helen would go on to say that one night Sally invited her to go with Sally to a get-together with this new group of friends that Sally made and Helen said that they were playing with an Ouija board and that they, not her, um, she said she didn't partake, but that they were all holding an oracle on the board and Sally went into a trance. Helen thought that Sally was just playing around, like playing a joke on everyone, but that she stayed in this trance state for a while. And it was at that point that Helen said she got very uncomfortable and said that she felt like she needed to just get out of there. And she did so right away. Now, again, all of this is alleged. I've seen a few interviews that contradict one another, that there was cult activity um, included, um, sorry, involved, and that other ones said that there was not. Um, but it has been said numerous times in news reports and articles and in the Unsolved Mysteries episode where each of the victim's parents spoke on it as well. So you can research to see the different theories out there. And again, all of this took place when Sally was in high school. And this is when she would also come to meet Shane Stewart, which was around the fall of 1987. Shane was, um, so now we'll go into who Shane was and a little bit of backstory on him. He was born August 5th, 1971, and I tried to find information about Sal um, Shane's mom, and I couldn't find anything, just information about his dad. His dad's name was Marshall Stewart, also from San Angelo, Texas. Marshall would be described as positive, sweet, and he, his dad, Marshall, compared him to Beaver Cleaver, meaning that he was very lovable. Um, anyone that he came around, he would make them laugh. And he always wanted to make sure that everyone was always having a good time when he was around them. He also loved baseball. He was popular and had lots of friends in high school. Now, they would both meet, and this is where Marshall states that from the time Shane met Sally, they were inseparable. And it was as if they were meant to be together. And just made for one another like soulmates. It is said that Sally introduced Shane to her new group of friends that we just discussed and Marshall would go on to say that Shane's behavior began to change a bit and that he started getting into fights and specifically on one occasion Shane was fighting this guy and getting the better of this guy in that fight and the guy had two friends with him. They all decided to jump Shane and threw him into the lake. Um, so Marshall was, he was always there for his son and he would tell him after that incident just to be aware of his surroundings because that could always happen again where he could get jumped or even worse. Uh, he was just worried about his son, of course. 
um, Shane, you know, being a kid, uh, would just tell him it's okay, you know, it's not a big deal. And him and Sally just got a lot closer. A few months into their relationship, they decided to move into an apartment together. Now, in San Angelo, where they grew up, as I mentioned earlier, was peaceful. So crime wasn't something that you often heard about there or anything of that nature. But Sally and Shane were definitely worried about something. And this would be known a few months after they moved in together. Um, this would be around March of 1988. Because remember, they met in the fall. So March of 1988, the following year, one day they both called the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office to have an officer come out to their apartment because they stated that they needed to file a report about something. So... Sheriff Larry Counts went out to their apartment to take a report and Sally reported that some of the members of her group of friends they were in that allegedly began engaging in criminal activity. Some of the criminal activities mentioned were drugs, violence, group intimacy. Sally also told the sheriff that she and Shane were trying to distance themselves from this group and that is when she handed over a weapon. Now, one of the guys in the group gave this weapon to Sally and Shane to hold. She then proceeded to tell him, the officer, that the guy told her that the weapon had been involved in a robbery slash unaliving. So Sheriff Counts collected said weapon and stated that during this meeting with Sally and Shane, his first thought was that possibly they made up the story, but once he did some investigating and obtained the serial number off of the weapon, it in fact had been reported as stolen. So at that point, he stated that their story was more credible to him. He also reported that the couple did express a level of concern and that Shane asked if it would get back to the group that they had in fact turned in the weapon. And they stated that they could be in danger for doing that if they found out that that had happened. Um, again, they were trying to break away from the group and Sheriff Counts told them he couldn't make any promises on anything, which just makes me so mad because they were trying to do the right thing, you know, so they should have had protection, but they definitely had a reason to be concerned considering they knew the ins and outs of this group and for them to turn in that weapon, in my opinion, would have put a target on their back. And they must have felt the same way too because after filing that report and handing over the weapon, they both made a mutual decision to leave town, but they chose to leave separately. Um, it's not mentioned where either of them went for those few months. Um, they were gone for four months and it is worth mentioning that two weeks before Sally came back into town to San Angelo that she called her friend Helen that I mentioned earlier who again was not involved in the group. Um, she was just Sally's close friend and she told Helen that she was concerned to come back to San Angelo because she was scared that they, meaning the group, was going to unalive her. Helen stated that she didn't take this comment seriously and that she also asked Sally why she was thinking that they would do that to her but Sally just told Helen that she couldn't get into it any deeper right now and in Helen's own words, she thought that Sally was just exaggerating. So, she didn't feel that it was worth mentioning to anyone at the time, um, not to Sally's mom or anything. So, another curious case, uh, curious thing that happened was that, it, and it may or may not have anything to do with the incident, on Shane's end, when he was back in town already, that at his dad's house, his dad stated that he could hear Shane on a phone call from the other room and the conversation was about owing somebody money but he never knew who it was that Shane was talking to and when he asked Shane about it, 
Shane just told him that there was not a problem, everything was okay, and Marshall told him that he could help him with whatever was going on. And Shane again just told his dad everything was fine, don't worry about it, and said that he was going to be leaving for the night to go meet up with Sally, and told his father that he would be back around 11 o'clock that night, and Shane, uh, Marshall stated that Shane was very good about being home on time, so... He just told his son, you know, have a great time, and unfortunately, that would be the last time, the last night, that Marshall would see his son alive again. And this is where we get into the night of the incident, which took place again on the 4th of July. This was going to be the first time that Sally and Shane had seen one another since they moved back into town, so a reunion of sorts. And since they had both been gone for four months. They were excited to see each other. They made plans to go see the fireworks show that they put on at a lake called Lake Nasworthy every year and to catch up. They met around eight or nine o'clock and from the Lake Nasworthy location um, fireworks display, they stopped by to get something to eat after they left there, but it's not known from where. That'll be important later and I'll tell you why. Um, I feel like it will be something that will come into play later, but again, I'm gonna leave that to the end of the video. So, after they pick up something to eat, they head over to a different location, another lake called O.C. Fisher, um, where they went to a picnic area, they parked to eat and just hang out, and this would be the last known sighting of the couple alive by a park ranger who had seen them while he was making his rounds. There was also another eyewitness by, last name was Littlefield, so Mr. Littlefield stated that he was on the lake fishing that night, and from where he was, he stated that he saw a vehicle pull up to where Shane and Sally were parked, and said that he heard arguing and heard someone telling someone else to just leave them alone, and yelling that they weren't going anywhere with these people that pulled up. Then he stated all of a sudden he heard nothing, couldn't see anything after that. Now keep in mind, this was already close to midnight and night fishing was a really big thing there, but it's so pitch black out there and very quiet. So he could hear them fairly well and the only reason he could see was because of the car lights from a distance when the unknown vehicle pulled up to where Shane and Sally were. So now we get to the next day, July 5th, and the couple's parents were extremely worried because they never came back home. And at the same time, a park ranger found Shane's car, but in a different location than it was the night before. There was food wrappers laying in the seats and the keys were on the dashboard. And he thought that it was very odd. This is when Marshall would get a phone call about Shane's car being found and he said at that point he had a really, really bad feeling because Shane absolutely loved his Camaro and there's no way he would have just left it like that and with the keys just laying out in the open on the dash. And right away he filed a, a missing report would be filed for the couple. They could not be found and nothing would come of this. No leads, no information about them at all until four months later on um, in November of 1988, some hunters were in the Twin Buttes Reservoir, which is another lake in San Angelo. So these hunters came upon some skeletal remains and contacted the San Angelo Police Department the first set of remains they would find were identified as Sally. And from that point, Shane's dad, Marshall, had been listening to police scanners since the time he went missing to hear if they found anything, any updates. And then four days later, they would find a second set of remains. And he got the location as quick as possible, and he ran up to the scene. And this was about 17 miles from O.C. Fisher Lake, where they found Shane's car. And this area is where the lake had dried up years before, so it was very dense. 
and there was trees everywhere, high grass. Uh, Marshall stated that he begged the officer on the scene to let him see if it was his son Shane and they actually did let him go and he did identify his son by the clothing that he had on. He said it was exactly what Shane was wearing the last night he saw him. And the sex part just crushes my heart but he said he leaned down next to Shane's remains and told him we found you son let's get you home. So autopsy reports would state that they were both S-H-O-T in the head with a possible S-H-O-T-G-U-N. And to this day, there have been no arrests made for this tragic crime, no other answers, and the case went cold. Then one day, years and years later, specifically on June 12th, 2016, there was a man named John Gilbreth, 47 at the time, from San Angelo, Texas, who would be arrested for an unrelated crime during a traffic stop on suspicion of possession of the devil's lettuce and an unlawful possession of a firearm by a felon. An unlawful possession of metal or body armor by a felon and this would then lead officers to do a raid of his house in an attempt to locate ledgers used in the criminal offense of narcotic T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-I-N-G and they also found some items that were tied to Sally and Shane. Specifically, they found personal writings, which in the news article quotes specific to the criminal offense of M-U-R-D-E-R. -E and it included their names along with three audio tapes that had the letters S-S written on them. According to the affidavit, it stated that he was also in possession of biological substances which included but were not limited to hair, blood, fingernails, and other bio substances that constitute potential evidence of a double H-O-M-I-C-I-D-E, which occurred in San Angelo, Texas on or about July 4th, 1988. The document also mentions him as a person of interest in the double H-O-M-I-C-I-D-E. Three days after his arrest, it was said that the FBI announced that people from their behavioral analysis unit would be assisting in the investigation. But I'm not sure what good any of that did because nothing has come of it and you would think with all of the damning evidence they found on the suspect that it would be enough to make an arrest, but no. He's still out. He didn't get charged with anything pertaining to Sally and Shane's case. Like, how in the world? I have no idea. That's why I'm doing this video and I'm still trying to figure out why nothing has moved from that point. He got taken to jail for the other offenses that I mentioned, but not for their case. Now, it would also be worth mentioning that John was also a part of the group that Sally and Shane were trying to get away from. So here's where my opinions come in. Now, hearing all of his offenses, it's not a far stretch to say, allegedly of course, that maybe he was the one that handed them that weapon that they ended up turning in. To me, that screams motive in that he got angry and was pissed that they turned it in. Another thing that I would like to know is where Sally and Shane went to get food that night because it mentioned that in Sally's pocket, they had found a fortune cookie paper that read, you will always be surrounded by friends. Now, my opinion that with all of the cases that I've seen, sometimes people that commit unalivings uh, like to keep souvenirs, trophies, what have you, and they like to taunt officers and the families and the victims. That sounds like a possibility to me that it was a message to Sally and Shane, you know, after that, just because they expressed that they were worried and they were trying to get away from these people. Um, it's a, like a, just, just taunting in my opinion. You Like you were always gonna be a part of this group. You were never gonna leave us. But you know, maybe I'm reaching, right? Maybe, maybe. But it's the small details in these cases that have solved so many cases. 
you know, it's every single thing, whether it's big or small, all of it matters and can help solve the case. So that's why I would like to know where they went to go eat. If that place that they picked up food from, if they gave out fortune cookies, then okay. She may have kept that fortune as a reminder, you know, just a memory that her and Shane spent them that night together, you know. But to me, if they didn't go anywhere that gave those out, then I truly believe that could tell us so much. And who knew that Sally and Shane were back in town, um, where their locations were going to be because they went to two different, you know, three different places, essentially, like Nasworthy to pick up food and to O.C. Fisher. So I don't think that it was a coincidence, um, you know, where they spotted somewhere, where they followed to that location you know so lastly I wonder if by giving that weapon this was giving Sally and Shane that weapon this was the group's way of having some sort of leverage over them because maybe they already saw that Sally and Shane were pulling away from the group and this may have worried them that Sally and Shane knew about all of the criminal activity and this could have been their way of trying to keep them in you know, sort of like a threat that if you have this weapon, if we give Sally and Shane this weapon, then that was a part of a robbery and an unaliving, then they're involved also. They'll go down. And they probably told Sally and Shane that. So it's it's just a lot. It's It's very sad to think that they were trying to do the right thing. And I guess it seemed like they felt they didn't have a choice, but they made a decision. They they turned it in and it, you know, there was a reason that they were so worried. So it just blows my mind that they didn't press this friend group harder and ask them more questions, you know, get, get some more answers out of them. But all we can do at this point is speculate until more is done and we find out why the case is not moving why this man or other people involved aren't locked up with all of that damning evidence after 34 years. The huge question is why the hell did he have all of those things in his house? If he had absolutely nothing to do with it and that is what it just it just makes me angry. If you know you were so adamant about not being involved in this case why were all those things found in your house? You know, it just, it's just insane to me that nothing's been done. Now, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do like to see all sides of cases that are out there. Now, there are some theories that I've read some threads on that there's possibly corruption from the cops, allegedly, of course, and that the main suspect, Mr. Gilbreth, was possibly related to somebody that was a cop. And that is why he wasn't arrested. But why would they have put all of that information in the news articles if they weren't going to do anything about it? You know, if it was a cover-up, I don't think that they'd put that in the paper. But, you know, like I said, um, I want to get everything that I ran into on these threads that I was looking into. So, again, I'll post everything down in the description box below. Um, so take this all with a grain of salt. But... I just thought I'd include it. But again, there's just so many, too many questions and odd things out there and, and not enough answers. So I'm hoping that by making this video, we can get eyes back on the case and maybe with enough information coming in, we can help solve it and finally get some justice for Sally and Shane and their families. I'm also gonna include two interviews that were done on the 25th anniversary of the tragic day with Sally's mom and Sally's stepfather and another interview with Shane's father that I really encourage you to watch. Um, they give you some more information about Sally and Shane and just some little details. Um, Sally's mom said that Sally was buried with her beautiful prom dress as she never got to wear it and that they were buried next to one another to be together for eternity and I know that they are. I know that they're together. So in Marshall's interview, he stated that they no longer celebrate 4th of July and both of the parents are just absolutely devastated that there's still no answers and it just crushes me to my soul 
that these two beautiful kids were taken from this world way too soon and from their families. They never got to see what they would have become. They never got to see them get married. They never got to see them make their own little families. It's just, it's not right. And it's not okay that no one has been held accountable for this. You know, and I, I can go on and on, but that's the case of Sally McNally and Shane Stewart. And if you know anything, please call the number that I'm gonna be linking down below where you can remain anonymous and just do the right thing like Sally, like Sally and Shane were trying to do. They were trying to do the right thing and get away from this group. And, you know, if, if you were a part of this group and you know more than what you said at this time, just please come get this off of your chest already. Get it off of your chest and help these families find and get the closure that they need and deserve. I know that it doesn't bring Sally and Shane back, but it will close the door on this chapter so that they can begin to heal because they lost their entire worlds and have been shattered ever since. And to my listeners, if you made it to the end of the video, I truly appreciate you for being here so very much. And I appreciate your time because time is very precious. So I hope that you will come back and see the other cases that I'll be bringing that don't have much to, if, like I said, if any coverage at all. I hope that you all have a wonderful day and please be safe out there. And until the next one, 